Good morning. Welcome to the Long Live Alternative Parties podcast. Free Press Media Press Inc. and Alternative Parties Books Publisher sponsors this podcast. I'm Andrew Bouchard. Welcome to Long Live Alternative Parties podcast. Alternative Parties friends, we have another exciting guest on our podcast like we always have. His name is Eric Forrest and he's going to talk about an organization that he runs. He's going to talk to us about all the exciting things he does in that organization. So welcome to the podcast, Eric. Hey, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Eric, we're glad to have you. So let's get started by you kindly giving us an introduction to yourself, a brief biographical sketch. (laughs) Great. Sure. So, yeah, my name is Eric Forst, and I'm the founder and executive director of Civics Nation, which is a nonprofit educational organization I started in um, 2014, um, really uh, designed to help um, American voters understand fact from fiction so that they can make policy decisions. Um, a little bit about myself, I grew up in Reston, Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C., um, and then uh, studied political science at the University of Virginia, so I had uh, a lifelong passion for understanding politics, political philosophy, and and history. Uh, And I built a career for myself in marketing. Um, Starting in uh, 1995, I started running corporate marketing departments. And, you know, was lucky to uh, be working in marketing then because that was the beginning of the web. And, uh, you know, I was building websites and HTML and uh, supporting a small sales team at a customs brokerage and freight forwarding company at LAX. Um, And so I did that for a while, and then um, eventually in 2007, I was invited to um, be the first salesperson uh, for a a SaaS marketing software company, SaaS means software as a service, and it was a company called Visible Technologies that was one of the very first social media analytics and listening platforms. Um, And so what we were doing was sentiment analysis and influencer identification, um, uh, for this new emerging media called social media. And so we were mostly looking at blogs and user forums, uh, and Facebook had just barely come out of the norm at that point. It was one of many <clears throat> other networks that we were starting to track. So uh, so that was um, really a foundational experience in terms of um, what led me to start with this nation. And, um, you know, we, you know I, I've been – working in, in marketing technology ever since then um, and have done a bunch of different startups in AI, and uh, tech analytics, and image recognition, uh, and blockchain. And that runs with the tech startup called Boxy, which is a web suite RF. And I'm also an advisor to a, a new kind of social network called Pangea. That's a, that's a brief biographical sketch. Excellent. It sounds like your background positions you well for running an organization like this. You mentioned marketing, and you also mentioned a major in politics, political science. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's really, uh, it really helped me sort of understand and see a lot of what's going on online. And, and so very early I became aware of how ad tech worked and that there were these algorithms and, tar- and and that we were all being targeted, you know, and, and I um, I actually was man marketing for an online ad network in 2005 called Bandare Media. And um, so, you know, I think a lot of the reason I took that job is I really wanted to understand how it worked. And, you know, so I got very familiar with cookies and pixel tracking and all the techniques of, of, of online marketers and advertising technology then and it's been uh, essential to understanding the way that information and disinformation travels around the web. Excellent. So if you want to tell us how you started your organization, we'd love to hear about that. Well, sure. Um, So, you know, along the way of um, analyzing social media for for corporate clients um, and, you know, helping them – Kind of listen and learn from the conversation, as we used to say back in the, in the early days of social media. I think that's still the, the same advice that that you give, which is listen, learn, and then engage. Um, I was I was very fortunate to 
uh, be part of the team of Visible Technologies, which was uh, that social media listening platform. Uh, I was very, very lucky to be part of the team that sold that software to the Obama for America campaign in 2011 and 2012 for his re-election campaign. And, um, you know, that was the time that the Tea Party was emerging. And uh, so not only was I seeing the sentiment shifting in our tool and the way we were measuring things, but I could just sort of see it in the conversations I was having online. And I remember in 2012 becoming really alarmed when I saw some some, some friends of mine, some neighbors in, in the neighborhood where I was living in Orange County, California, which is, you know, a very, you know, kind of red county in a blue state. Um, but lots of Democrats like me with down there too, uh, was the first time I'd ever seen someone in an online conversation describe the collection of taxes as armed robbery. And so, you know, that, that was alarming because to me, our political system and the laws that we make in Congress are all about peaceful and nonviolent ways to resolve disputes. In fact, you know, arguably that's the number one reason why we created a constitution in the federal system. And so to have these people equating it with violence or a threat of violence was really disturbing to me. And, you know, and, and that rhetoric really grew out of the Reagan era, and it grew out of Reagan's idea that government is never a solution, but it's only a problem. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, dumbing down that bumper sticker slogan, slogan, and that's not exactly what Reagan said. He said, you know, in these times, government is not the solution. It's the problem, but that thought, that idea, you know, combined with um, reading Ayn Rand and, and listening to Rush Limbaugh and Fox News gave rise to, you know, this new generation of con American conservatives that believe government should do almost nothing except run a military uh, and that we'd all just be better off in this extremely libertarian type of environment, and I just think that's a naive way of looking at the world and the dangerous way of goes over the yeah. again, that gives rise to oligarchs and, and, it, and it's a new this is what now after 40 years of break. So the civic nation really grew out of this alarm and this, and this passion to want to sort of shift the conversation and make sure average voters um, were, were aware of facts and, and kind of understood the history and the implications of embracing potentially fascist or violent ideas like, like the idea that if the government wants to tax you, then it's an armed robbery. Um, and so, yeah, and, and the other thing I mentioned this to you when we were talking yesterday is that, you know, I, I saw in 2014 the Republicans getting really organized. You know, they were, they were burned by, by losing as badly as they did in 2012. And their online platform um, actually crashed the technology they used to get out the vote, crashed on Election Day, um, whereas the Obama campaign had been using advanced tools like ours to identify precinct-level sentiment analysis and sort of micro-target and shift the message to, to uh, swing districts and swing straight states. And they could see that you know, by using smart technology. So uh, the Republicans learned from that. And, you know, by the time um, Trump ran in 2016, uh, you know, they were using um, platforms like Cambridge Analytica and, and micro-targeting content on Facebook in a really smart and effective way that Hillary uh, did not embrace to that degree. Um, so, so in 2014, I could see this shift happening, and I was starting to call the people I knew at the Obama campaign kind of in alarm, like, hey, what's going on? And, you know, the Republican message is just nonstop. It's persistent. It's really organized. And I just don't see any type of grassroots effort taking place on the left. I don't see message control. I don't see, um, you know, en enough groups and, and Facebook pages and the kinds of things that are happening on the right. So Civics Nation was just my attempt, my way to kind of, um, you know, uh, on the on the side while I'm being a media executive kind of run an office that could show a different way to message and a different way to use media. And that's, and that's what our mission has always been about. I, I can't say we've, we've come close to achieving it. I think we've, you know, made a small ripple in the pool and, and you know, most of the other progressives and liberals who I collaborate with, you know, we, we all feel the same sense of frustration and dread with each election cycle, you know, where Democrats should just be dominating the message uh, or not. And the Republicans seem to always be controlling the message. And uh, so, 
so civic nation is like how do we get liberal and progressive ideas to have a similar kind of resonance and virality online. Interesting. So you mentioned your mission. If you could distill that down to a mission statement, if you have a mission statement, or if you don't, what would that be? Yeah, you know, we we do have a mission statement, and it's um, it's really um, to help voters make informed decisions and be able to recognize the core myths that drive the, the policy making that's out there. It's you know it's meant to be different from a fact checking site where it's not about just responding um, each new lie embedded in each new news cycle. It's it's more about how do we um, teach voters to be able to understand that and, and recognize that on their own. So if you go to our blog uh, at civicsnation.org, a civics lesson embedded with so I, so it, it was trying to take the news of the day um, and teach people basic civics because I think a lot of the reason the the, the myths and the the lying are able to take hold is because people just don't have enough um, education. They just didn't learn civics or they didn't learn enough civics in history to make that informed choice. So, so that's that's the hope. And you know, on Facebook. Um, I get down in the in the trenches more on a daily basis and just kind of post the 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 news and opinions that I think are important to kind of win the, the news cycle and from the from a from a fact based point of view. But I can't say that I've succeeded. I have a long way to go, but I have some great collaborators who share my vision and, and I think uh, we're getting close to hopefully hopefully um turning the tide. I think this last sure. election I think this last election was hopeful. It showed this message of, an, of there being an existential threat to democracy. It really got through, and it motivated a lot of a lot of voters to turn back the so-called red wave that never happened. Yes, yes, very true. So, what? How do you think progressives and liberals should change their messaging to make it more effective? That's a great question. You know, I think it's a combination of both. Me- the, the messaging and the technique. So, okay. so the so the messaging. The problem is that um, the the left and progressives are, are almost always on the defense. They're not putting forward a grand vision. So, on the right, this you know that message that I mentioned of Reagan: government's not the solution; it's always the problem. Um, that's really um, a message that comes out of a long history of a very libertarian uh, notion within, I would say, the conservative movement that actually, if you listen to or read um, the Boston College historian Heather Cox Richardson, she has this amazing newsletter she writes every day where she analyzes the news of the day and puts it into the historical context. Uh, she does great podcasting on Facebook. Um, she talked she talked a lot about how it was as early as the eighteen seventies that um it was mostly Democrats then um complained about uh you know all of the new newly empowered um, African American voters and politicians that they were trying to, um you know, they were trying to build those <laughs> and build infrastructure for their communities that had, had nothing. And so as early as that era they were they were warning people of Socialism um, that that we as the reason why you shouldn't um, have taxes or any money go to help those people. But that was just you know taking money from from hardworking white people and giving it to underserved people. I mean that then shows up again in Paul Reagan's welfare in his first campaign in 1980. And so you know and, and for that it was just that. that um, Nixon unleashed on the world to try to motivate um, mostly racist Southerners um, to vote Republican. And, and from the 60s through the 70s and 80s, thousands and thousands of formerly Southern Democrats and, and, and even independents and Democrats all over the country switched to Republican in, you know, in the name of low taxes, but we all know that really they were being motivated by this racial animus. 
of not wanting their tax money to go to prison. So, you know, that that has been the Republican strategy. It's been incredibly effective for really like 150 years. And there's nothing like it on the left. We don't have the, the, pod, the story we tell about what we're going to do or what we stand for. And so the Republicans are always able to, to, to misrepresent our message. So, if, you know, it, admittedly, it's bad branding to call yourself a democratic socialist, but when Bernie and AOC came along with just kind of a, a you know, like a, a FDR New Deal style of capitalism, uh, and, you know, and it, it gets turned into the, the Democrats are all communists, right? So it's just, it's just, we, we don't help ourselves, our messaging, uh, with, with marketing, you know, with messaging like that that doesn't understand marketing. Uh, you know, ideally, Bernie and, and AOC would call themselves social democrats. So be a much better branding. So we have a branding problem. Um, and, and, and I think that the message needs to be something like, you know, sometimes government is the solution. It's a more nuanced message, so it's harder to communicate. You know, like most progressives in the world, I don't want any form of totalitarian socialism. I, I want, you know, that democratic form, which still honors our constitution, our free speech, all of the rights that we have, but it just pushes forward uh, an idea that government, you know, needs to control some things like utilities and have more influence over banking and, um, you know, things like the EPA, environmental regulation, to, to help level the playing field and make sure we have a capitalist economy that works for all people. So, so it's something along those lines that the Democrats need to, to be saying. And then the technique is they need to be saying it over and over again in lots of different groups, in lots of different ways, um, the way Republicans do it. They have what I would call a right-wing propaganda machine that is tightly interconnected. You know, when you look at network maps and analyze their ecosystem, you know, the campaign with Breitbart and Fox News kind of setting the message, and, and then um, all of these other bloggers and, and people on Twitter, they take that message and they rewrite it and they repost it in a thousand different ways, but they're all saying the same thing. They're all singing from the same songbook, and it's kind of like, you know, they've got a dog that very easily align themselves the simple messaging and they spread it and distribute it widely, whereas the Democrats, it's more like herding cats. You know, we're, we're more, in a way, I think, nuanced thinkers, independent thinkers, free thinkers with different points of view um, and who all kind of, like, seem to take pride in maybe being their name or their ego is connected to it. It makes it much harder for us. So we, it, that, that's like this puzzle that, that my friends and I have been trying to solve. So do you think the messaging should change for elections versus progressive news in non-election seasons, or do you think the messaging should be the same? That the messaging for – that the progressive messaging should needs to change? Change during the election time? So, so should – should when candidates are running – who are progressive candidates, when they're running, should they do different messaging than – a progressive news outlet would do? It depends on their district. You know, like, okay. you, know, you look at someone like Katie Porter, who runs in a really close district that, you know, was traditionally you know, the last 50 years until she flipped it blue, has been a Republican district. Um, and, you know, she just focuses on the economy. And she just focuses on, tax, you know, on kitchen table issues. And she's great with her whiteboard and just breaking down different and you know she doesn't take any money from corporations so she runs this completely grassroots campaign and I think a lot of people like that um, you know so she's just amazing on being able to be a progressive voice in a, in a kind of a swing district like that and win um, you know whereas if you're AOC in a much more liberal district you can you can talk more about social issues you can talk more about um, some of the controversial issues and you don't have to worry about about whether you're going to win that seat or not. So it's really, you know, kind of each candidate has to know their uh, community and their voters and, and customize their message. Sounds good. So you mentioned that you founded the organization. Are What what role do you have currently in the organization? Well, the, right now the organization is um, is really just 
just me and, and I've got one or two other collaborators who sometimes um, help help host some Facebook page. Um, in 2018, we had some funding and I had a staff of writers who helped create lots and lots of blog posts. Um, but just, you know, just life, you know, and, and my and the demands of being a dad and, and having a day job, it just made it, made it hard to keep the funding going and keep that full staff and organization going. So we run pretty lean now. Um, okay. And, yeah, and it's, and it's really just um, mostly myself these days. Okay. Sure. Makes sense. Yeah. So earlier, more than once, you talked about the arguments people use of you don't like where they say taxes are like armed robbery. The the libertarian conservative people would say that it is armed robbery because if you don't pay your taxes, you go to jail. So how would you respond to that in a way that advances your message? Yeah, you know, the 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 thing that that ignores is the idea that you have a elected representative who is your voice in Congress that is there to help make that law and set that tax policy. So if, if so if so to say that is to say that you think our entire system is either illegitimate or that the elections are rigged or that um, you know you're somehow disenfranchised and have no voice. And, and I think it just deeply misunderstands um, what a representative form of democracy is all about, really what a constitutional republic is all about. Um, you know, I think if you go back and you look at the letter that George Washington, the cover letter that he sent with the Constitution when the Constitution was submitted uh, to the Continental Congress for review and ratification, um, it, it's amazing. He talked about how we basically have um, a system that was designed to resolve compromises, a system that you know, is one in which no one gets what they want. Here's, here's the quote. I love this. I have it at the top of the page. This is just an excerpt from the letter. He says, individuals entering into society must give up a share of liberty to preserve the rest. And then later he says, and thus the Constitution, which we now present, is the result of a spirit of amity and of that mutual deference and concession, which the peculiarity of our political situation renders indispensable. So he's basically saying, look, we, we created this constitution as a way to peacefully resolve disputes, and the only way it's going to work is if everyone is if people realize you, you're not going to get what you want all the time, right? That's the whole point of having a constitution, having a, a, a Republican democratic form of government is that you have to make compromises, right? And so that Tea Party point of view is saying, nah, that's all, that's, that's, that's not what our government is about. Our government is just about giving an individual power. And it's a deep, deep uh, misreading of why our country exists and why the Constitution was formed in the first place. Um, and, you know, I just, I just think that um, it's just dangerous. I mean, it really, I, you know, I think when I started seeing that, I started, it really, it really in my mind, I, I was envisioning what happened on 1-6, you know, as a result of that way of thinking. Um, so I think that, that January 6th is, is and political violence from the right, which and FBI, all the people who look at domestic political violence will tell you, is, is by far coming from the right. I mean, what happened in 2020, those riots, I would say, were mostly anarchists and looters who were apolitical, who were actually doing the violence. There was very, there, there were no leaders on the left encouraging violence, calling for it, or endorsing it in any way, despite what they say about one tweet Cameron Hills wrote about bail reform, cash bail reform. So, you know, it, it's dangerous, and um, and it's just it's just a completely wrong way of looking at history. I don't just have no patience for that way of thinking. Sure. So what is your marketing strategy, if it's not too proprietary, for getting people to read your post? Are you using SEO? Are you using some of the things you learned in your marketing job? How are you getting people to come to reading your posts? Yeah, you know, it's, 
it's it's really most you know I use sometimes I do paid ads I run some of the Facebook posts I'll promote them if they're if they're doing really well um, mostly I just rely on the on the algorithm and yes we do have SEO that we use on our on our blog post I, I guess it works pretty well because I think you said you found us through a, a Google search so I, I know we have some of the blog posts that we put up that rank pretty well um, but. You know, I would say that um, the the thing that 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 I'm really hopeful for is, is I have some collaborators like Laura Don, who used to be the creative director of MoveOn.org um, 15 years ago, and she um, now has this uh, political media company called Art Not War, and they they um, make amazing, mostly progressive political videos for candidates and, ca- and campaigns and causes. Uh, and she's really deeply connected into the um, liberal donor class, and she regularly gets funding for her video work. Um, and we've been working on this idea called the Ethical Media Network, and, and and so the idea is that all the different progressives need to have a platform that incentivizes, encourages them to kind of work together more and share the messaging and share the content in, in the way that the right wing does. Um, you know, it would start with having, like, kind of a war room where um, you would have what, basically what they do at Fox News and Breitbart every day is they kind of decide on the messaging and then they start cranking it out. Um, and they make those decisions based on using technology and using smart tools that can you know, understand what people are saying and what resonates with them. So, yeah, there's all kinds of tools to boost the message. But, again, my, I think my, what I'm looking for in the future is how to incorporate citizens like that to expand our reach and help um, other progressives um, reach reach more voters. Um, and the other thing is, is not directly connected to civic nation, but it's um, this technology called Pangea. That I'm sorry, what's the technology called? It's called Pangea, Pangea Social, and it's, okay. it's not online, it's not live, you, you won't see anything on it out there, but um, my the, the founder of that is uh, a guy named Lawrence Al, who I used to work with about 10 years ago. Uh, we ran a tech analytics company called Synapsify, and it's based on his work in AI. And um, he's been developing an amazing algorithm that I think is, is really holds the key to um, to helping truth prevail. It's the way to allow any social network, if they run his algorithm, to kind of have the users auto-moderate. It just basically gives you kind of like, it gives you suggestions, you know, edit a post for drama. It gives you suggestions on how to edit a post to make it more civil and less toxic. Um, So I'm very hopeful that that kind of algorithm, that kind of technology, which really doesn't care if, if you're on the left or the right, because there's plenty of toxicity that does come from the left, uh, it just looks for extreme bias in text, and it can and it can flag that, flag that and give you some advice on how to make it less biased and more open-minded. So I think there are, are amazing technologies out there uh, and techniques that that we know are working uh, that we need to embrace on the left. Sounds good. Is it are the since you're since you've worked in the field, it sounds like you can access a lot of the technologies. Are some of them very expensive to access if Fox News is using them, or is it something that more progressives could use if they wanted to, and it wouldn't be a cost matter? It's, you know, it's it's not a question of cost. It's a question of um, what gets funded. You know, there's there's plenty of money, you know, I'm clearly George Soros and, and you know SBK was SBF and they can say was giving a lot. Uh, I would say there are more billionaire donors on the right. The Koch brothers being the most famous ones and Sheldon Adelson. But but on the left, it's not a problem with the money. It's a problem with the way they. Uh, earlier this year, I was talking to someone connected to that money machine. They're saying, "Look, we're just you know." I like we like this idea that you and Laura have, and Laura had these created create this amazing series of videos, which was, are doing what we would call narrative building, doing what they do on the on the right, but doing it on the left, like helping left, progressive and liberal voters understand the history, understand the 
but it's, it's just amazing videos. Um, and it's just not getting a lot of funding because the, the feedback we were getting from the left wing billionaires was, well, we only want to fund it if it's get out the vote, if it's specific to a campaign cycle. Just simple to, to do that, you also have to fund the narrative building. You have to under, you have to fund um, the, the companies and the organizations that are creating media that create that long-term message of, yes, sometimes government has to do some things to help average people compete in a capitalist society, and th that just doesn't happen. Sure, sure. So, Eric, how can our listeners support you and your organization? Well, lastly, I would say just um, follow Civics Nation on Facebook. Um, you know, we're just it's a page. You can search for Civics Nation. It's Facebook.com slash Civics Nation. Follow us there, like our posts, share our posts, um, follow our blog and and share our blog posts. Um, and that is the main way you, you could help us. You know, it would be amazing. So the blog, what's the address for the blog? The blog is civicsnation.org. Okay, that's Perfect. All right. So we thank you for coming on the podcast today and talking about the exciting things you've been doing. Andrew, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate what you're doing, and um, thanks for giving alternate voices in the U.S. political landscape a voice. That's very nice of you to say. So we wish you all the best in your blog and all your other personal and professional endeavors. Thanks, Andrew. All right. Take care. All the best.